folks, we are here with Tony, who's been on the streets of London for how long? I've been on the streets on and off pretty much my whole life, really. I've been, are we recording now, yeah? Sorry. Um, yeah, I've had a pretty much chaotic lifestyle since I was a child. Um, I was brought up around ad addiction, um, alcoholism. I've been brought up around violence. Um, I've been abused when I was a child. I put into children's homes. All right, let's, so let's get back to the beginning. Yeah, no, no, this you is part of the Your parents were... What made you homeless? Not right. What was your job before you became homeless, before you lost your address? Um, I'm a senior JavaScript software engineer. Now I got mental health, B's got mental health, so why are we out here? So you had an accident, Yeah. a bike accident, you were on a yeah. bike, you were and, probably and drunk, my, right? Yeah, yeah from, from, from uh, cocaine, from heroin, from crack, tablets, wasted. I don't know my real father. I, I grew up with my stepfather, which was my brother's dad. Um, I classed him as my real dad for 12 years because I don't know my real father. Um, my mum was having an affair with somebody that was in marriage, and that's how I was born. So you've never met your real dad? Once or twice in a pub when I was about six years old. And when he introduced himself to me, he went to give me some money. My mum pulled me away and pulled me out of the pub. She didn't want me to have anything to do with him, you know. Mm -hmm. and I, uh, because my mum is now dead, but I've had, I don't know why, so I'll never know why. She, she, was, she didn't want me to have any relationship with my father or anything. All right, but you grew up around addiction, did you say? I grew up, my mum was an alcoholic throughout my whole life. Um, she was a functioning alcoholic when I was a child. Um, she did well up until I was about six six or seven years old and then she started losing control of her life so therefore she couldn't look after me. I've got two other brothers, I have an older brother and a younger brother. She couldn't look after us after I became about six or seven. Um, my mum used to get seriously like beaten up by her boyfriends and through the up when they came home from the pub my mum would get beaten up a lot and they used to witness a lot of violence and like growing up. I got put into a children's home. I got put into a care care home when I was about seven because I was abused. Um, at this time I had a, a cannabis addiction. I was smoking cigarettes, smoking cannabis. My mum used to smoke cannabis, so that's how I started smoking it. Because I how old you've been when you started? To I was about six or seven years old. What? Six or seven years old when you started to smoke cannabis. And do you think cannabis affected you somehow, or did you get? It wasn't so. But well, it was the start. It was the start of it. And what so. what happened then? What what drugs? Uh, it's, it progressed on to gas, aerosol, sniffing gas, glue, things like that. So it, it's what we did at that age as children. When we were that, well, when, I'm going on to when I was about 10 years old. It's what we did at that age, you know. Everybody was into it. We used to sniff aerosols, gas, glue, things like that. Um, I've always been a good person. I've always had been a conscious person, you know. So I've always had that in mind. So I've learned not to lose myself so much being out here you know but it's being through so much being through so much experience and so much addiction and all the bad things i've seen in my life it's give me enough knowledge and experience to be street wise enough myself to not get taken the mickey out of the street basically but um one of my biggest problems out here is actually convincing people that i'm actually homeless a lot of people don't believe me uh, I have a spice problem. I smoke spice at the moment. Spice problem. Yeah. This is my my only issue at the moment. Um, what put me on the street this time? I've been out for about two years this time. Um, I'll be honest to you. I've, I've served about 13 years of my life because of my addiction, drug addiction. I've got a he very heavy addiction throughout my teenage years on crack cocaine. Are you, are you done with it? Or I'm it? done with it now. I, I will explain in a minute. Uh, is uh, I started on crack cocaine, uh, which led on to heroin. I was through my teenage years. I was totally out of control. I was shoplifting. I was doing anything to fund my habit. I, I hated myself for it, but it was the only way I could survive to keep my addiction going. And um, withdrawing from heroin is not very good. It's, you feel like you're dying, basically. It's a really horrible. They call it a clap. It's, it's um, something I wouldn't wish upon anybody. So I had to get break out of it. And to be honest, it was so hard to get away from there. Again. I stopped doing it. I had to take myself away from people that were doing it because it was like 
influencing me to do it, you know. So when I was getting like a little bit of clean time, I was started mixing with people that were taking it. So then I ended up relapsing and going back on it. Anyway, my life's been chaotic throughout my whole... I'm 40 years old now. My life's been chaotic. I've done 13 years of my life behind prison because of addiction. Um, I stopped like that. I made a conscious decision after my mum passed. I turned my life around. I came out of prison about four years ago with a qualification working in the catering industry. The catering industry? Yes, I've done really well. I walked out. How long have you done prison for? I've Tony? done about 13 years of my life in 13 prison. years in prison? In total. Just roughly what, what, what for? Uh, for funding my drug addiction. When I, it was mainly through my teenage years. That's when I was at my worst. I was at my peak on my addiction when I was in my teenage. How old are you now? I'm 40. You're 40? Yeah, so I've gone through it all, you know, and I've come out the other end and I'm still alive, thankful, because I've had so many people that have come through and not come out of it. They've died. I've had a lot of close people to me that have passed away out here. A lot of people seem to think this is a game out here. It's not a game. It's people's lives. You know, it's like, and it's trying to convince people yeah. that it's... it's People's conscience, people's emotions, people's feelings are involved. It's a very deep thing, you know, and um, a lot of us has to a lot of us has to block this out because of people taking ripping the taking taking advantage of us, you know, your vulnerability and all that, you know, you have to hold up a shield. I'm sorry I'm a bit all over the place like talking to you, That's it's just right, I'm a bit muddled up. It's, um, well let's get back well you've done thirteen years in the in prison. Yeah. And and uh, when was it the last time you've been in prison? I was in prison about three and a half years ago. So you've been trying to keep yourself away from prison for the last couple of years? I've miraculously turned my life around overnight. When that happened to me and my mum passed on my birthday, I came out. Was I that came, recently? Last it was three years ago. Three, three years, years ago. ago it's, I basically came out with a catering in. I was qualified, I'm a qualified chef. I came up with a good qualification of uh, yeah. and walked into my dream job. My life changed overnight. The doors were happening so quickly and I became a qualified chef in a pub called The Slug and Lit. It's round the road. It's, it's, it's a middle class bar, restaurant type thing for the community, really, for office workers and things like that, middle class people. I was really good at my job. I'm a really, that's where I come alive in the kitchen. I'm very, I love working around food and that. So I, I worked on it and I came out of prison with a, a good qualification. I've got an MVQ level one and two in professional cookery, which makes me a professional chef. I then came out of prison and walked into my first job, which was the slug and lettuce. First legal job, I was paying tax. I felt so proud of myself when I was doing this because I turned it all around overnight and I stopped all the badness and I was trying to go straight. My mum died on my birthday after this happened. I fell apart and I lost my head. I couldn't cope with it. I tried to continue working, but I was just messing with the orders up. I was costing the company a lot of money. My boss had to let me go in the end because he, he was aware of my mother's death, he was aware of my background, but he gave me a chance because of my potential. He ended up sacking a, ta a chef he had for, six, uh, for 12 years and he gave me the position because of my potential. He saw how good I was. You know? so I was doing really well and then I, I just fell apart. I lost my life mentally. I'm, I'm a really emotional person. It's like I wear my heart on my sleeve. And, just, and when that happened to me, there were so many young answered questions that I needed to ask my mum about my dad for example so many things I needed to know in my life when I was well, tell me about your spice addiction yeah because uh, well basically I was, from when I was young I smoked cannabis how long have you been smoking spice for? about about three or four years it's, uh, it's, I've, I've basically changed it from cannabis to spice because I, was, I used to smoke cannabis and basically people started mixing chemicals in it and it really affected my lungs and I started coughing my lungs up and I was having coughing fits. And because of the change. cannabis? The cannabis, yeah. Okay, because people were putting like yes. artificial stuff in it. Yes, and uh, so I had to stop. I stopped that overnight and I ended up putting in place the spice in place to take away that, that void, you know, you know, that empty space inside you. If you quit something, it's called a void. It's, it's an empty space inside you that you need to fill with something else. And they call it cross-addicting. That's what they call it. You know, when you change one drug for another, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's called cross-addiction. That's what they call it in recovery. You know? Cross-addiction. Yeah. And that's what you had. 
Yes, I've, I've cannabis and spice. I cross addicted. I, I went from an addiction of being on cannabis every day. I used to smoke three apes a day. That's like sixty pounds worth a day of cannabis. It, because I am, I have so much mental health. I suffer with terrible anxiety. I have panic attacks. I have depression. Um, I used to try and commit suicide. I used to try and, you know, I, I gave, I suffered badly from depression in my youth years. You know, it's, um, I've got so used to being in this lifestyle as well. You know, it's, it's what I'm used to. It's just being around all this. Is, um, yeah, that's right on it. Have you got any phone number that people can contact you and help absolutely, you? Absolutely. Uh, would you would you share would your phone to, number now? I would just like to say, guys, it's just uh, for anybody that is watching this. I just want to say, please, like, take into consideration that this is people's feelings and people's lives that are involved in it. Sometimes people don't portray their feelings as well as what other people do. They're not as good as expressing themselves. So if people are trying to explain themselves to somebody on the street, because it's not often we get blanked a lot. A lot of people walk by and ignore us on the street. So if there's anything I can pass on to people, is that just please listen, because sometimes it can help. Just listening to one thing, like there might be one thing that somebody would really want to get out and share with somebody. That could save somebody's life. You know, as it's just one thing. You know, when you feel like everybody's not listening to you and you feel like you don't exist, it can put you into a very depressive world. Yeah, I've noticed that a lot of homeless people would, and they like to talk, they like to be Yeah, and from, from experience, because of this has happened, I've had people kill themselves over it because no, they feel like nobody listened. I've had people commit suicide over it, so it's a very serious thing. And um, a lot of the community and the public seem to think it's a game. And as um, people judge, uh, people, there's a lot of judgment going on uh, people thinking um, like I said in the beginning of this interview a lot of people I, I struggle convincing people that I'm actually homeless yeah. so because of the way I look because I look too clean but it's uh, basically it's, there's not there's no persona or any way a homeless person should look it's just because a person's scruffy it's because he might have a serious issue he's got a lot of things going on in his head he, that's how he's got that way I choose not to let myself get that that bad, you know. So I'm trying to keep my head above water, but it's getting harder, which is why I look that little bit cleaner than most homeless people. But a lot of people seem to think that if you look clean, you're not homeless. So sometimes I feel when I wake up in the car park around the back, I sleep in the car park around the back. If I don't make like twenty-seven pound fifty for a hotel, which is in Courtney, I'm not going to say the name of the hotel because it will get the guy into trouble because he's supposed to take bank card and he accepts cash and he gives me a room for one night for twenty-seven fifty. I sleep in the car park. I don't make the money up every day because I have to say it's convincing people that I'm actually homeless. A lot of people don't believe I'm homeless. I struggle badly. Um, I have a lot of regular people around here that have followed my story for the past two years, and that's how I survive out here. And how much money do you need every day to feed your habit? Uh, well, do you know what? I've done so well, I've minimized everything. It's to, my only habit now is just a spice. It's 10 pounds a day. Just the spice, how much do you need to spend on it? But a lot of that I get for free anyway, so I don't really spend it. That's why I've produced it, I get my spice for free. And how much money are you able to beg? Uh, to be? If there is, I try and beg up as... The money I beg for is not to support my drugs. That's what... I, I, this is another wrong thing people do. People seem to think that the money we're begging up is all for drugs. It's absolutely incorrect. It's not true. We, we all get tarnished with the same brush just be, because one person supports their drug habit when they're begging money. It don't mean we all support our drug money. You know, we, we use it for different things. I use it for a hotel. I use it to wash with. I use it to wipe clothes. I use it to wipe phone credit to keep in contact with my key worker. Because I, my, key, my housing, my key worker is just down the road, their office. He comes to me every day to have a catch up to see if there's any updates on anything or if any place, any accommodation has come up for me. Because I'm a very private guy, I need my own space, so I've had to turn down the hostels because I'm in recovery from Class A. I don't want to put myself in that, we're at risk of putting myself at risk of using again, so I've had to refuse hostels because I know hostels are actually absolutely full of people with addictions. I don't want to throw myself back in the fire, so I've had to refuse the hostels and wait until my own place come up. So this is why it's taken a little bit longer for me to get a place, you know? Because I'm, to keep my own self safe and free from addiction, 
Because I'm in recovery from the hard drug at the moment. I'm having to stay out on the streets because I don't really get on the streets because they're, they're heavily influential, influential people in there that can lead you back into using hard drugs. I don't want to do that because I'm doing so well at the moment. You know? I just All right, Tommy. And I, just, I just don't feel that. It's, it's, a, it's a lack of support out here. You know, I could sit here all day talking you, you know, just open up a whole can of wine spot. I know you're in the middle of the And if there is any advice that uh, you could give to people, what yeah. that would be? Um, take things with a pinch of salt. Well, as, as a homeless person, take things with a pinch of salt, not to take things so personally, and don't hold grudges. Don't hold grudges. grudges. Yeah. Oh, right, my friend. Because it can have a ripple effect, and it can cause a lot of issues for you out on the street. You know? But yeah, it's like I say, it's hard. It's, it's not easy. Is there anything else would you like to add to that interview? Um, I hope things get better. Things will get better, and I wish all homeless people, I hope, you're all the best, I wish you all the best guys, because I know what it's like out here. I'm not a fake one, I'm actually one of the real ones. Uh, it's like I said, I struggle every day with convincing people I'm actually a real homeless. But yeah, I know how it feels, guys, so just keep strong and keep it going, because there's people like this gentleman here that keep my spirits up and you, you help me to stay positive and that, you know, because if it weren't for guys like you, we wouldn't get noticed. We'd just get forgotten about and left and treated as the on the side, you know. All right. Thank well, you. thanks a lot for the interview, my friend. Thank Hope you get better. You. Uh, stop the drug addiction and uh, get yourself a place. And I hope not to see you on the streets again. Me too. Well, if we do, hopefully in better circumstances. Right? Exactly. All the best. Cheerio. Thank you.